We're interviewing John Ashcroft, Attorney General of the United States under George Bush, 2001 to 2005. Uh, welcome and thank you for your yeah, time. Glad to be with you. Okay. Growing up, your father dropped out of high school. Yeah, he did. And then went on to have some graduate degrees and was president of three church-affiliated colleges. You've written several books, one of which, On My Honor, tells the story of how your father raised you. And more than just having you observe him and learn from example, he was an active teacher in what he taught and how he taught. What were some of the lessons your father found important to teach you? Well, <laughs> I think he taught me about honesty, mm -hmm. about uh, sharing. The nature of God is sharing. God shares with us the very essence of his creation. He creates us in his image and he wants us to act like him. Not high and mighty, but to be sharing and caring. He uh, was uh, mentioned that we should always uh, pursue important things, the kingdom of God being the most important thing. Don't uh, major in minors and minor in majors was one of the things he told me to do. Uh, he taught me that ideas and actions have consequences. I remember my father uh, was part of a little flying club at least that referred to a group of men who jointly owned an airplane together. Mm -hmm. We went up in a little Piper Cub one time, and he said, see that stick in front of you, John? Push that stick forward. We, I pushed it forward. I was about six years old. <laughs> and we just were going like off a cliff. And it was one of the ways that my father taught me that, uh, that things you do have consequences and don't mess around with things you don't know anything about. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> that would be pretty intense as a six-year-old. Well, it was I. My my father was a very resourceful person and a very creative person. He could look at the same things that uh, other people looked at, and he always could see what they saw. But he generally could see things that they didn't see. And I think real education is the ability to, we all see the same world, but the person who has the ability to understand and to see things that he observes in ways that others might not becomes pretty valuable. That's where my dad had great value. He could interpret both scripture and life in ways to reveal, you know, it's the kind of thing that people are saying, well, why didn't I think of that, you know? Mm -hmm. And so when he... Uh, when he would share insights that he had. I, th I think maybe insight is the right word there. Now, when you were in high school, did you envision becoming a lawyer and then going on into politics? Oh, I'm not sure what I envisaged. I thought I was a, an athlete. I ended up going out east to school because I was mm -hmm. too small and too slow to play in the Big Eight, which was the conference that Mizzou was in at the time. The coaches, uh, several coaches from out east uh, recruited more or less. I don't, it was nothing like modern day recruitment. There was no image and likeness payment. And it was, I think, I, the most I ever, I ended up with a t-shirt from Dartmouth one time, but I don't know. <laughs> I, did, I didn't go there, so. so. But I thought of myself as an athlete, although I've always preferred to, to steer the operation mm -hmm. rather than just to be along for the ride. So you wanted to be a quarterback as opposed to a receiver? Yeah, I, although I do like to be a re I did it from time to time. When in college, there was a time when I left the quarterback position to catch the ball and see if I could outrun the enemy. I mean the opponent. <laughs> uh. Well, your career had quite a trajectory. 64 Yale bachelors with honors, 67 University of Chicago law degree, 67 to 72, you taught at what is now Missouri State. Yeah. 72, Missouri State Auditor. 74, Assistant State Attorney, Attorney General, sharing an office with Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. Yeah, I had the privilege of spending about six months in the same room with Clarence and two other fellows. There were four of us in an office that wasn't wasn't as large as this room, but we were close enough if we needed to to wad up paper and throw it at each other. <laughs> uh, 
Clarence Thomas really is an important figure in my life. I mean, having grown up in a, in a community like Springfield was at the time with very few uh, minority individuals in the community, Clarence clearly demonstrated to me early in the uh, opportunity we had for office sharing that he was at least the equal, if not the superior intellect to everybody else in the office. Oh, and really? I still cherish him uh, as a very, very, very valuable public servant. I, mm -hmm. I teach law now at Regent University in uh, Virginia Beach uh, for a couple weeks a year, and I tell my students, wow. if you want to really know and understand the case, read the Thomas dissent. And then if you want to find out how someone's going to obfuscate the facts and all to get to a result, which they had made up their mind to get to in advance. You can read the majority opinion, but Clarence Thomas will tell you exactly what happened. What you see is what you get with Clarence Thomas. <laughs> well, how did, how did Thomas compare to Scalia? Well, very closely. Uh, the mythology is that when Thomas went to the court, he copied Scalia. Uh, the truth of the matter is that in a number of the early cases now, it's been revealed that after Scalia saw the Thomas draft, he scrapped his own and signed on to Clarence's. <laughs> so those are, uh, Scalia is a very, very, very good justice and a fine individual, and I think he and Clarence Thomas got along very well. I had the privilege of going with uh, Justice Scalia to the Soviet Union when there was a collapse wow. of the uh, Soviet Union, and we sent a delegation of individuals from the United States to see if they would want to embrace a sort of federalist approach like we had with a variety of states contributing mm -hmm. to a nation. By the time we got there, they had already gone on off on a different track. So we didn't have a chance to confer in the same way that we would otherwise have had a chance to confer. But I remember one, one very cold night walking around the, the perimeter of the Kremlin with uh, Scalia and uh, just enjoying his company and obviously soaking up the intellect that he uh, he sort of oozed intellect in in a way that was uh, it, it had a somewhat uh, jovial aspect in it. He was nice. he, he was a guy who was had had a real sense of humor, just as does Clarence. I mean, Justice Thomas, I should say. Uh, Clarence Thomas swore me into office uh, as a my wow. time as Attorney General, I, you get a chance to choose some of the things that happen to you in life, and making good choices is the stuff of a good life. Well, you know, that brings up a good point. Okay, 74 years sharing an office, I guess for six months. 76, your elected State Attorney General. Has Clarence already moved on? Well, almost. I think there was a, there may have been a day or two. So were you, were you his boss for a while? I can't really say with certainty that I was, but it was close. And uh, Maybe even if you were, you weren't really. <laughs> well, you know, uh, let me just say this, that good leadership is really collaborative. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there comes a time when the leader makes the final decision about what you do. Leader's responsible. But he, find, he ought to, on his way to that decision, he ought to welcome as much wisdom as is possible. Mm -hmm. That's just a Bible principle that, you know, you invite wisdom from the perspectives of many advisors. I mean, right. I, I'm not sure where in the Proverbs that's, and that'd be a corrupt translation. But uh, there is wisdom. And, of course, I think the Bible says if you ask God for wisdom, he gives it to you liberally, lots of it. And I think that means he'll send the right people your way. That's certainly been the, whatever good things have happened as a result of my time to be in government. I uh, I think it's a result of the fact that I've had a lot of really good people who have decided that this guy needs help so desperately that we're going to go help him. <laughs> and that's the truth. Uh, and uh, it's a great way to live, too. Collaborative leadership, I guess, would be the right term. And it may be there is a discipline like that. It may be that there's actually something that exists in writing. But it, that's my idea, is to invite invite as much information and perspective as you can into the decision, even when you have to make the decision and be responsible for it exclusively on your own. Uh, your, your chances of having a good decision. And, and let me just, there's another principle here involved, and, and this is one, this is sort of a little chunk of 
rhetoric that I've formulated for myself. Making a good decision is only half what you need to do. Okay. You have to make the right decision, and then you have to work to make the decision right. Very few decisions, once you make them, automatically carry on without any adjustment, without any help, to a successful conclusion. Right. I like to think of it as a transatlantic flight. All through the flight, the pilot's up there when he encounters a different air currents or different weather conditions, making adjustments. And mm -hmm. mid-course corrections are the science of arriving at the right destination. <laughs> and if you... Yeah. If, if you don't, if you're incapable of the part of the decision making that's making your decision right by working at it, then you could end mm -hmm. up in Milwaukee instead of Chicago very easily. True enough. Okay, 1980, you were re-elected state attorney general. And in 83, you uh, write the leading amicus brief on Sony versus Universal Studios supporting VCR use for time shifting. I don't know how significant that is, but you know that's something that kind of reached out and touched a lot of the families in the US. You don't want to be violating the copyright law. Yeah, yes. Well, I only bring it up because so many things, Supreme Court decisions, they're good and you support them, but they don't feel like you'll ever be affected by them. Well, everybody's been affected by this one. Now, exactly. I'm not, now, I'm not sure advertisers like it because my wife and I scarcely watch a program when it's originally offered. Oh, there's nothing like fast forward through commercials. Need I say more? <laughs> <laughs> okay, 1985 to 1993, governor of Missouri. 1994 to 2000, U.S. senator from Missouri. You lost re-election to Mel Carnahan. Well, Mel Carnahan was deceased at the time. So I'm the only guy in the history of the world, I think, that's lost his incumbent Senate seat to a deceased opponent. Well, you know, I reading some of the history, I kind of had this sense that um, you were doing fine, and then he passes away. And it's like that did something for his campaign. Oh, well, <laughs> there's no question about that. We were up by a, a nearly double digits in the, on the Friday, and then he and his son were in a tragic airplane accident, I think, Sunday night. And then the polling by the next Friday was flipped. And I yeah. suspended my campaign. I didn't yeah. think it was appropriate to campaign against a deceased person. The other side didn't suspend his campaign. They brought in the President of the United States and other people. But, you know, I don't live regretting what I did. That was 2000. 2001, you were appointed to U.S. Attorney General. This is another, go back to the book my dad, about my dad. My dad taught me that resurrection is a feature of life. Mm -hmm. That, uh, and uh, I think the Christian faith is that in every crucifixion there's a resurrection. Uh, and so I, little, did not, little did I know in losing the Senate seat that I would as, uh, subsequently become the Attorney General of the United States, but it turned out to be a happy circumstance for me, although there were very serious challenges in that responsibility. Now, backing up just for a second, in 98 you considered running for the presidency, I understand. Yeah, I told you I had an ego. And, uh, <laughs> Why didn't you run? Well, it became clear to me that I couldn't raise the kind of financial resources that running for president requires. Uh, just for a quick story, a fellow who was my fundraiser spent two years raising $3 million in my behalf. When I decided that wouldn't do it, he went to right straight to George Bush's campaign. And in two weeks, he raised $3 million. And when I said, wait a second, three it took two years to raise three for me, and it takes two weeks to raise three for him. I think that I'll be calling that man Mr. President someday, and sure enough, <laughs> I did. And he was yeah. a good one. And I ended up serving the people of, Missouri, of America at his appointment. Some people say you serve the president, and you do. But in the Justice Department, there is a sense in which uh, it's, it's, there's a sense of... Uh, 
independent justice that should prevail? Well, you know, this this isn't in my script. And I, um, I remember when I was young, for some reason I had a discussion with my mother, and, and it was all about the turnover of the presidential appointments at the inauguration. And she was saying that certain jobs, they turn over. You know, labor, education, agriculture, da-da-da-da. And certain other jobs did not turn over because they should be above politics. Um, justice, uh, Department of Defense, intelligence agency people, FBI, those sorts of jobs. Well, the Justice Department is at the is one of the four anchor cabinet positions from the beginning of our republic. And it is appointed by the president and serves at his pleasure. But I, uh, and I, I heard one of my successors say this on television recently, but I, I think I was the first guy to coin the phrase that justice is the only department of the government that's named for a virtue or a value. Hmm. Uh, and uh, it is... Uh, and it's illustrated in art, and it's illustrated in so many ways, the blind justice, the yeah, scales the, of justice not uh -huh. to be tampered with. There's an, And I think that's one of the delicate responsibilities that is subject to contamination, seldom has been contaminated, but it is when it is contaminated, it is a major disability that's imposed on the culture. And if the people of a country lose confidence in the justice system, it is a wound to the culture that may never heal. It's, I, I, uh, one of the things uh, I think it's fair to say is that you can burn a house down in 20 minutes, that it takes 20 years to build. The same is true of reputations, particularly reputations that were based on trust, and, as, and instead of trust, there's been betrayal. Betrayal evokes maybe the most powerful of emotions known to man, and uh, when justice is perverted by betrayal, it's a real wound to the culture. Now, you've obviously spent a great deal of time in public service. Why did you choose that as opposed to private practice? Well, I started teaching. You know, I, I graduated yeah. from law school on the 9th of June and started teaching on the 12th. And wow. I, I think teaching is... Uh, is public service. Yes. And uh, the ability to speak into the next generation and to speak into it with a sense of scale, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, law cases are one case, one set of facts at a time. Public uh, service deals with the environment in which these other things unfold and develop, but you have a, a sense of scale in establishing the framework the guidelines, the rules, the boundaries within which other things take place. And I like teaching because I was had a chance to share the values which were important to me with uh, hundreds of students. And I think another jingle of mine is that the transmission of values from one generation to the next is the single most important job of a culture. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think that's what charmed me not only with teaching, but it charmed me with the idea of serving in public life. Now, being governor, Missouri is a capital punishment state. How did you reconcile your faith with your power over execution as governor? Well, I never sentenced anybody to death, but I had an opportunity to, to uh, commute a sentence or to pardon people. But I believe the Bible teaches capital punishment, so I'm not, I'm not wound up that, that somehow it's unchristian to have capital punishment. And Jesus had all the power in the world. I guess he could have not only called 10,000 angels to rescue him, but those who are next to him. But my, my analysis of capital punishment is that it saves lives, and it saves innocent lives. And the best studies that have been done on it are that uh, for every person that is capitally punished, there are about seven to ten lives that are saved. Wow. Now, people came to me, particularly it was a group of, uh, I think, uh, Catholic clerics one time came to me and 
ask me, how can you possibly not pardon all the people or commute their sins? And I said, well, it's self-defense. If I can save 10 innocent lives or seven innocent lives as a result of taking one guilty life, who am I to go and say that the innocent lives ought to be lost because I didn't believe that there should be a capital punishment to take the guilty life? I actually gave an example. I said, what if we were sitting around the table with a, I were with a set of Girl Scouts. They had come to interview me. I was at, with the local sheriff, mm -hmm. and a guy breaks into the room and starts shooting. And the first person he shoots is the sheriff, and the next three starts shooting the, the Girl Scouts. I have his gun next to me in his holster. Do I take it out and shoot the assailant, or do I let him continue shooting around the room till we're all dead? Well, they said, uh, they said well, well, for me, that's self-defense. Yeah, yeah. And in the cultural, the problem with capital punishment is you don't want to identify who the people are whose lives you're saving. Well, I think the other problem is that there is no, the time span is too great, that the punishment is not timely to the crime. Well, I guess I'm not willing to let the perfect be the enemy of the good here. Uh, I, I think the, of the studies that are done, they, they agree with you that the closer the punishment is to the crime, the more people are deterred. President Reagan one time told me a story. I don't know if you have time to hear a Reagan story. Or not. Sure. But I was chairman of the, or president of the National Association of Attorneys General, and, and Reagan and his people had been very favorable to me, and some other attorneys general wanted to go in and see the president. So they said, take, me, take us in to see the president. So I think I called up Mike Deaver and said, we need, need a few minutes with the president. And I brought three or four other attorneys general with me to the Oval Office. And the president took the occasion to say that he supported capital punishment. And the guy said, why? And he said, well, I had uh, engaged in the first execution. There was a hiatus for quite some time. And there was a 25-year hiatus before I had to make the first decision. And I made the first decision statewide. And the first decision whether or not to uh, proceed with an execution at, at the federal level when I was attorney wow. general. But uh, he said that after he had allowed the uh, execution to go through, he got a package in the mail. And the package was some kind of little gift and a, a note attached to it said, Dear Mr. Governor, uh, I run a liquor store in Oakland and the thugs broke into my store and they had me at, on the floor and a knife at my throat and said they were going to kill me. And I yelled, well, you'll get the death penalty for this. And he said, the guy dropped the knife and ran out of the store. He said, thank you, Mr. Governor. <laughs> now, I, you know, that's not what you'd call a, a scientific study with a control group or anything, but it was good enough for Ronald Reagan. And it kind of was convincing to me, too, that uh, they had that kind of a... So I, I, I don't take any, any, I don't cherish, and I don't, but I think it's a responsibility of government to uh, carry out things that prevent the loss of life. Mm -hmm. And uh, self, in, in, in an organizational or a, a community's self-defense requires sometimes harsh penalties. And in the absence of those harsh penalties, I think the community suffers. And what's interesting is it moves the suffering from the guilty to the innocent. And that's an irony, which is a very substantial and difficult irony for me to accommodate. I, uh, I think it's something that's happening pretty often right now in our cities where the prosecutors have decided to just let uh, thugs run rampant, smash and grab, merchandise and mm -hmm. burn buildings and burn police cars and, and the like. Now all, all these all these preceding jobs, did they help prepare you for becoming United States Attorney General? Well in some ways I think they did. I mean obviously just general experience. You know there are about 130,000 people in the 
Justice Department when I got there. So the idea of how you can sort of delegate responsibility, you can invite with co collaborative leadership ideas, um, uh, the idea of way you, the way you can uh, motivate people to give their highest and best. I think uh, I like the MBWA, they call it management, by walking around, mm -hmm. just showing up. Uh, when I was governor, we uh, spent time once a month honoring a specific department. And the morning we would have the honoring, I would go to the department and I would go through the department just shaking hands with as many people as I could and say thanks for work. Nice. People actually showing up. And then at lunchtime, we would always invite some group from Branson up to the Capitol to the big atrium in the Truman Building. And I would bring my brown bag lunch and the people from the various departments, the department being honored, would, were invited to bring that. And we'd sit and eat our sandwiches together and you'd laugh and sing and clap with the Branson group. Uh, uh, one of the big challenges when I went into the Attorney General's office was that the FBI was not known as a strong cooperator with the rest of the department, although it is a part of the department. Mm -hmm. And so I instructed that the second day, my first day, I shook hands with as many people in the Department of Justice as I could in the Justice Department building, and I said, the second day I want to, I'm coming to the FBI, and I'm going to touch as many people there and look them into the eye in the eye and say, uh, I'm glad for the opportunity to work with you, with the subliminal text being, you're going to work with us, and we're <laughs> going to cooperate. And right. I think it really it worked with therapy, and that's just how one little idea in one setting grew into a valuable technique or opportunity in another setting. Very good. Now, as, as U.S. Attorney General, you are a cabinet member. You were in charge of the FBI until 2003, the INS, the DEA, the BATFE, um, Interface to Interpol, and a number of other organizations. Like the U.S. Marshals. U.S. Marshals. Yeah. Secret Service? No, Secret Service was Treasury. And, okay. And, you know, because Secret Service was started back in, well, you don't want a history lesson, but back in the middle around shortly after the Civil War to safeguard the integrity of our money. Currency. Yeah. That's why they're the counterfeit people. Sure. And, it, and okay. uh, so you got the uh, secret, secret Service now has the idea. People think, well, that's the guys who protect the president. Mm -hmm. And it is. But uh, it started as the right. Treasury Department. Now, Given vast responsibilities, I mean, the entire FBI, the entire INS, DEA, how, how does a specific prosecution or investigation come to your attention? Well, hopefully you alert the, the department to what the priorities are, what the mm -hmm. principles are. And when they see an item that puts those things in play, they begin to move it up the chain. I see. And they should be. I mean, that's the way any any organization ought to exist. Mm -hmm. uh, it ought to have fundamental values. And when those things are not clearly uh, achieved in one course or another, in other words, there's a decision that's required as to which way to go, they should move that toward the ultimate decision maker. Okay. As Attorney General, what was your greatest challenge? Well, obviously, it was uh, to keep America, to re restore America's safety after 9-11. And if I have any regret, somehow I didn't anticipate 9-11. But uh, we uh, decided that prevention was so much more to be preferred over prosecution. You know, prosecution works retrospectively. You know what happened. You figured out who'd done it, who'd, who did it, who and you already have victims. You, know, you already have victims. They're, they're bygones, so to speak. Yeah. And, uh, and, and so all you have to do is, you, you know what happened, you have to go to court and you put the pieces in, fit the puzzle together and show the jury, and the jury says, yeah, that's it, and he penalizes this guy. Well, in terrorism, when the people seek to extinguish themselves in the commission of the crime, 
The threat of punishment is not a big deterrent. They're, they're going on to their, quote, eternal reward right. in the process of the crime. So prosecution is not a, a, an effective way of defaulting their operation. And so information becomes the number one friend of prevention. And you have to have information and gather it to anticipate it events rather than to re you recreate events in a prosecution in the trial yes. yeah. you anticipate events in prevention and you disrupt it so that it can't happen right right so those are those are different things uh 9 11 took more lives than than uh pearl harbor and they were civilian mm -hmm. lives they weren't military lives and i i i don't say military lives in any way to derogate military lives but do you in some ways, you expect those lives to be at risk in mm -hmm. national defense. And they were, and obviously great tragedy in Pearl Harbor. But you don't expect, and the international law doesn't expect civilian lives to be sacrificed in national defense. The Geneva Conventions are replete with rules that are designed to pre And so we had a, 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 a more numerous law, a loss, in New York than we had at Pearl Harbor, and these were civilians. So it was a big deal. It was an assault. And at that time of Pearl Harbor, Hawaii was not a state. Well, that brings us to the Patriot Act. Now, and again, I'm going to look at this. Um, the Patriot Act seems to be your biggest source of controversy for your tenure over the DOJ. It passed the Senate, 98, one, one no, one uh, no vote. Passed the House, 357, 66 no's, 9 no votes. Yet George Soros says you are responsible for the passage. I don't know George Soros. and uh, I mean, uh, I, I hope, uh, I think it was the, one of the more significant achievements. Mm -hmm. The fundamentals of the Patriot Act put in place in the war on terror a number of capacities that we already had for uh, fighting organized crime. I'll give you right. one of them. The so-called roving wiretap. And uh, that sounds nefarious. Sounds like a bunch of FBI agents in trench, cro trench coats going out with these alligator clips and just roving around and tapping anybody's wires. The roving wiretap refers to the fact that not that you go around and just tap anybody's phone, but instead of surveilling a specific telephone, you surveil a specific person. In antiquity, if, when there was a criminal investigation and the courts ordered a wiretap, they said you can tap that phone. Well, in the 1980s, the drug dealers learned that you can get these throwaway phones at the local stop and rob, I mean, it's convenience store. And they would use a phone for a week, throw it away, and before you could get another order to... Mm -hmm surveil another phone, they'd throw it away and and they so in the nineteen eighties they allowed in cases for drug dealers and organized crime the ability to surveil not just an instrument, not the equipment, but the communications of a person, which right. makes sense. Well that had never been extended into the area of surveilling for national security. Well, it only made sense that we provide the set of tools to safeguard America that we had already provided for in the war against organized crime. Most of the uh, Patriot Act was to do that. And if Soros says I'm responsible for it, it's the nicest thing he's ever said about me. I think it was the right thing. Now, there are some problems with it, and I've recommended that we, because frankly, it's recently been abused because members of the FBI have violated the law mm -hmm. and uh, used their violations, trumped up evidence, and to convince the court, the FISA court. court, to issue uh, authorizations to surveil various people. And uh, the one thing about surveillance, whether it's in the criminal en environment or in the terrorism environment, is that you can't tell the person you're surveilling. And I always said in the deadly game of hide and seek of terrorism, if the hiders know where the seekers are going to look, it ruins the game. I mean, you know, you can't. Yeah. So, uh, but 
So it has to be what's called an ex parte proceeding. You can't mm -hmm. go seek the warrant with the knowledge and awareness of the person who is the target. Right. right. And that makes it... Ex parte proceedings are not favored. They shouldn't be. And yet they must be in some settings. And so uh, I think that, you know, if you have a proceeding where a person isn't capable of defending himself in the civil area, they appoint what's called a guardian ad litem mm -hmm. for a child, for instance. They say, now you, you represent this guy and, and to make sure that justice is done. I think we ought to have something like that. In, well, for American targets and the fi citizen targets of the FISA law, and they're very limited. You have to either be have strong evidence that you're a foreign power or you're an agent of a foreign power before FISA applies to you. Mm -hmm. uh, but when it's an American citizen that's a target like that, I think we ought to have someone whose responsibility it is to sort of argue the case against the warrant. The one other thing I should mention quickly, and that is that in criminal defense, if you're charged with a crime, and I as prosecutor know about evidence that would help you uh, avoid your being called guilty, I have to give you that evidence. It's called, the, it's called the Brady Rule. Okay. And I think that ought to be clear. Also, when you go before the FISA court, if there's exculpatory evidence that would argue against the person, like Carter Page, who was the subject of uh, a FISA warrant, and it was a FISA warrant was unlawfully granted because the FBI was willing to use evidence which had been manufactured, bought and paid for by a political organization, and and that should have been known to the FISA judge. I would have been furious as a FISA judge yeah. if I had been deluded and tricked into issuing a warrant improperly. Is so there... I've, I, I've got these proposals that would put in place safeguards against that. We should have the Brady rule. And if a person violates that rule, they should never be able to practice law before government agency in the future. And there can be other penalties. I, but I've carried these things to the Congress, and they've been considered and are being considered. But that do, doesn't mean we can afford to be without an ability to gather information about potential attacks. Is there any teeth in any law that punishes an agent that goes off the rails like that? You know, we've got laws that have lots of teeth, but if we have officials that don't have backbone to prosecute them, all the teeth in the law don't cannot matter. survive a rubbery backbone on the part of an administration. And when you have prosecutors mm -hmm. that won't bring the charge or will purposely delay the charge till after the statute of limitations has run, in order to accommodate the individual who violates the law, the justice system is, a, is subverted and the people of the country are betrayed. And that's something well, we talked about earlier. Then we become an agent, we become a, a nation of men and not laws. Yes, we need to become, a, we need to be a nation of both, both men and laws. But the, but the rule of law is the kind of thing that provides the great equity of opportunity. Okay. And when uh, the so-called uh, equity of outcome is a, is a different thing, that's, that's where everybody gets the same outcome no matter what they do, and that's the definition of socialism. Mm -hmm. And that's why people are streaming to the border south, uh, to our southern border, because they've had enough of that. Everybody gets the same, uh, and uh, a yeah. lot of people want to get to an environment where you can be rewarded for and you know we're we've been a magnet for that disequ disequity, if you will, in out outcome results in different rewards. You got a lot of merit, you get a lot. I'm so glad that Elon Musk left South Africa and came to the United States to become the richest guy in the world, instead of going someplace else, because we had the environment that provided the great opportunity for reward. Now you're you're a deeply Christian man. I hope if uh, I'm accused of being a Christian, there's enough evidence to convict me. Secular people fear religious people and politics come up with no end of accusations about how 
your religion is going to cloud somehow how you execute your public office. Were there any situations where you felt a conflict in your responsibilities to the Constitution well, with your beliefs? First of all, let me state clearly that it's against my religion to impose my religion. Mm -hmm. I think the whole idea of the Christian faith is that it's a matter of inspiration, not imposition. Mm -hmm. And people are afraid that, oh, if you get those guys in office, they're going to demand that everybody be Christian. We've got safeguards against that in our Constitution, and I think they're right. The biggest problem I had was when, when it was my responsibility to administer the lottery. Oh. I think the lottery is the most absurd thing. It teaches people not the value of work. Mm -hmm. And it takes from the poor. And it's something that was, a, if, if, a, if a private individual were to conduct a lottery and have a book <laughs> and, and a numbers game and took over half of all the receipts and kept them and gave the rest of them away in prizes, it, he'd be a criminal. But somehow now we make it a state operation, and because it's a state operation, it, it's been converted from a vice to a virtue. And it's, I, I really, but I, I took an oath to uphold the law. The law was bigger than I, and I never have sought to promote the lottery. I think it's, and the biggest day on most lotteries around the country is the day welfare checks are cut. So what the right hand gives, the left hand takes away. And I, it, that's, there's an absurdity and all, to the level of almost being an obscenity in the lottery. And uh, we it's part of the, abandonment of the understanding that merit is what ought to... Uh, you know, we started the interview, we talked about consequence, mm -hmm. pushing the stick forward on the airplane, you go in a nosedive. Right. There are consequences. You know, from the very beginning, the story of consequence is the story of creation. Adam and Eve were told that they could make decisions, but if they made the wrong decision, there would be consequences. They made the wrong decision, and God took them to the edge of the garden and gave them the right, what I call the right foot of fellowship, kicked them out. <laughs> you know, there, and this is, you know, there may be, there is a sinister, there was in the Garden of Eden, a sinister creature who said, oh, it doesn't matter what you do. It won't make a difference. You're free. Well, freedom is not when you don't make a difference. When you don't make a dis difference, it means you're meaningless, not that you're free. And so I think the real challenge in life is to exercise your freedom in ways to have great positive meaning. And uh, so I pray to God that that's, that'll be what happens to me. Uh, and if I have a few days left, I hope, I, I hope they have meaning associated with them and in my dealings with, uh, with people. You're obviously working well past the end of your tenure as USAG. <laughs> I understand you have a law firm over a number of parts of the country. Yeah, there has some offices, yes. You ever going to retire? I hope not. Yeah. I don't think the retirement. I, I think it's, it's nice to have opportunities and a, and a variety of opportunities, and I do a variety of things. I spend a lot of time. My main passion is to support Christian higher education. And uh, I do that. I don't make any charges to the people. I, I wow. try to help in that way. I, if they pay my way to come and, and be with them or to do things, I do that. But I accept that. But I don't. And I don't say that as a matter of virtue, but it's not a matter of, of my trying to uh, aggrandize my financial status or anything else. I believe that we need the right set of values. As I said before, and the transmission of values is the most important job of a culture, transmitting from one generation to the next. And our educational system is failing us in, in inculcating and transmitting the right values. So I want to put my oar in that water and pull as hard as I can. So as long as you can contribute, you're out contributing. Well, people have to... I only go where they ask me. Oops. Hey, you're very generous. I appreciate Thanks. your time. So such is the life and times of John Ashcroft. Thank you very much, John. Okay.